Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on August 29th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Hurricane Adalia is bearing down on Florida, and later on in the show, we're going to get an update with a meteorologist from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. We're going to begin the show, though, looking at Saturday's mass shooting in Jacksonville and how easy access to guns in the U.S. is fueling hate crimes. I'm going to read here from the AP for a sentence or two about what happened in Jacksonville. Authorities say a white man wearing a mask and brandishing a weapon with a swastika emblazoned on it fatally shot three black people in Jacksonville in a racist attack. The assailant opened fire Saturday at a Dollar General store in a predominantly black neighborhood, leaving two men and one woman dead. The gunman then killed himself. Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters says the crime was clearly motivated by racial hatred, saying the shooter hated Black people and the shooter had tried to gain access to a historically Black college. The group Giffords put out a report called How America's Gun Laws Fuel Armed Hate, and we're going to talk about those connections with our guests. Giffords Research Director Kelly Drain. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad that you could come on to talk about this important topic and a very timely discussion that for some reason we as a society have been putting off and, and not really taking very seriously, it seems. So uh, we'll we'll try to take it seriously here and maybe that will be the beginning of a, a serious discussion that can um, save some lives. So let's begin with what's your group? What is Giffords? Yes, yeah, so Giffords is a national nonprofit organization founded by the former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Um, as some people may remember, in 2011, she was shot at a constituent event in Arizona. And then after the Sandy Hook shooting, she founded an organization that works to reduce gun violence in America. So we as an organization study the causes and the costs of gun violence. We educate the public about gun safety solutions, and we share our expertise with policymakers nationwide um, to promote efforts to prevent gun violence. And this report that I'm referring to is called How America's Gun Laws Fuel Armed Hate. And we're going to talk about some of the solutions in just a bit, but let's lay out uh, the issues for, uh, for our listeners. So what is the connection between hate crimes and gun laws? Yeah, that's a great question. So one is that we know that a large percentage of um, mass shootings and, and gun violence in general is connected or has some connection to hate. Um, in, in fact, in this country, there are 10,300 firearm hate crimes each year. Um, so that's, you know, 28 per day. Um, and we also know that the risk factors behind um, that, that motivate people to have these hate field filled ideologies also are connected to an increased risk of other forms of violence. So it's really critical that our laws are properly addressing this nexus between hate and violence. And so how difficult is it for someone who has committed hate crimes already to be able to access firearms? Yeah. So under federal law, um, if it's if you commit a, um, a, a felony hate crime, um, you know, a crime that raises to to the level of a felony, usually that's a crime that's punishable by more than one year in jail. You would be prohibited under federal law. But we know that many hate crimes um, are prosecuted as misdemeanor hate crimes, and federal law does not prohibit um, people convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes, which can still be incredibly violent, um, have tremendous cause tremendous pain for victims. Um, those are not um, prohibiting events, and people convicted of those crimes um, at the misdemeanor level can still access firearms. Um, some states have taken action to close that loophole, but there are still, you know, the vast majority of, or the, I should say, the majority of states that have not addressed that um, that loophole in our laws. Let's talk about some of the recommendations that you have for states and for the federal government that they could enact that would protect Americans from armed hate. We'll start with universal background checks to ensure that people purchasing firearms are eligible to possess them. What would that entail? 
Yeah. So universal background checks are the foundational policy that, you know, we really need in this country. Under current federal law, you are required to undergo a background check if you buy your gun from what we call a federally licensed dealer. So if you go to, um, you know, a gun store, a brick and mortar location to buy your gun, um, you will undergo a background check. They're very quick. Most of them make an immediate determination and are completed within 90 seconds. Um, but this is a really critical foundation for every type of gun law that we have in this country, because if we're if we're creating categories um, of eligibility, if we're saying that certain people aren't eligible, but we're not actually screening them, then um, we're really only doing half of the puzzle here. Um, so it is really critical that we have universal background check laws and studies show that those laws are associated um, with lower rates of violence and um and also lower rates of gun trafficking, which fuels a lot of our country's gun violence epidemic. Do we have an idea of how popular that is or unpopular, if whether Americans support or don't support background checks? Yeah, so this is, you know, again, one of the reasons that it is a, a priority policy is because it is incredibly popular with the American public. I think um, the American public kind of understands that this policy just makes sense that, um, you know, we get background checks to to have certain kinds of jobs. Um, and so it makes sense that to, to let people have a, a deadly weapon, we would, you know, make sure that they don't have any um, prohibiting criteria. And polling data that we see nationally and at the state level shows that 90% of Americans support these policies with high support among Democrats, Republicans, gun owners, non-gun owners. Um, so it really is an incredibly popular policy among the public, but um, has not gotten the same traction among policymakers. Our guest is Kelly Drain, Research Director with Giffords, and we're talking about the connection between hate crimes and gun laws. And just a reminder to people that later on in the show, we will get the latest about Hurricane Adalia. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I want to continue to ask about some solutions for, that Giffords is putting forward, some sort of policy solutions. One is that military style weapons and large capacity magazine regulations, uh, that if, if there are um, regulations that would more thoroughly regulate civilian access to these military style weapons, what difference would that make in, in uh, safety in the U.S.? Yeah, so military style weapons, um, like the weapon used in the Jacksonville shooting, and then large capacity magazines, they significantly increase the lethality of shootings, um, particularly these mass shootings that um, we are seeing, you know, horrible accounts of um, almost weekly. Um, you know that when uh, when people have access to a military style weapon, they can fire bullets more quickly. Um, large capacity magazines let them have more bullets in the gun, um, so they don't have to pause to reload. We know that that period where people pause to reload can be a time that victims can flee to safety. We saw that in the shooting um, that my boss experienced. That when the shooter was reloading, people fled to safety. So there is some good evidence that restricting the kinds of weapons that people have access to can reduce mass shootings and reduce gun violence generally. One study, for example, found that um, states that regulated large capacity magazines were 56% less likely to experience mass shootings. And Kelly, we have a caller on the line, if you don't mind uh, taking a call. And yeah. I should say that we're broadcasting live on August 29th, and the number to call in is 813-239-9663. You can also email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe, and I'm Sean Canan. Our guest is Kelly Drain, Research Director with Giffords, and we have Art on the line in Lakeland. Oh, hi, Art. I'm great. Um, the question I have is why can't we treat guns like we treat cars? Why can't we have a division of firearms like we have a division of motor vehicles? And you have to go there, you have to take a test, you know, you have to pay, you have to get in order to get a license. And then once you have your license, you know, you've had your background test and your license. Um, you know, and then you treat it just like you would a, a car thing. You'd have to renew it every three or five years. And that way, every time you bought a gun, it would immediately be registered. You know, just like, you know, a car is registered. 
Yeah, I, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's a really wonderful question because many states have actually enacted systems that are, are very similar to that, maybe not as extensive as what you're describing, but um, there are several states that have what we call licensing laws or permit to purchase laws that require people to get a license to obtain safety training um, to you know, be fingerprinted before they can get a, per a permit to own a gun um, or to purchase a gun. Um, and those laws are incredibly effective. I think one of my very favorite studies looked at um, Missouri repealed this law and Connecticut implemented this law and gun violence went way up in Missouri and way down in Connecticut. So it is a very effective kind of system um, that we can put in place to reduce violence. Well, thanks so much to Art for that call. And maybe to follow up on that, one other thing that you could use a car registration as a model is the fact that everyone is required to purchase car insurance. And there's been this discussion about whether uh, there should be ammunition insurance or gun insurance for people who have firearms to, because there's such a, a high risk and high liability potentially there that, that maybe they need to be insured and that the government needs to regulate that. Yeah, I think that's another really interesting policy solution. It's something that we haven't really seen states or localities implement, um, broadly speaking yet, but it definitely is an idea that, that potentially could be effective in reducing gun violence. Well, let me go on with the other recommendations that were made in this How America's Gun Laws Fuel Armed Hate Report from Giffords. And this next one has to do with extreme risk protection order laws. What what does that even mean, extreme risk protection order laws, and how would that be, could, could that be a help in the solution for this problem? Yeah, so extreme risk laws are a really innovative policy solution. They're built on other firearm protection order laws that we have um, that have existed for a long time, but they operate a little bit differently. So the way that they work is that they allow law enforcement or in some states, um, family members and other key members of the community to petition the court for an order to remove firearms from people that are po that um, are are demonstrated to pose an imminent risk of violence to themselves or others. So this is a determination that's made by a judge based on very, very strong evidence. Um, but it is something that we see as very effective. You know, Florida passed one of these laws in the wake of the Parkland shooting. Um, my understanding is that that shooter had been the subject of multiple tips to the FBI, had been in contact with law enforcement, but law enforcement did not feel that they had a legal mechanism to arrest or um, or, or otherwise um, diminish this person's um, access to firearms. And so these kinds of laws, these extreme risk protection order laws actually do create that, that legal process to remove firearms when there are warning signs. And the reality is that before most mass shootings, um, there are number a number of warning signs that are observed by others and people are generally concerned about these individuals before they um, perpetrate their attacks. Kind of going off of that answer is that this question that comes in from an email from Bubba, uh, text message that is, and he's it's he's kind of drawing the connection about to find out if, whether there's a connection between mental health and gun violence. Bubba writes, I found it interesting that the Jacksonville shooter's dad called 911 before the shooting and said that he was off his meds. And so Bubba says, um, is there a connection then between mental illness and these mass shootings? Yeah, that's a really great question. So what the research has actually found is um, that there, there, it's better to look at sort of dangerous behaviors and dangerous warning signs rather than diagnoses of mental illness, um, simply because the vast majority of people in our country that have mental illness will never be violent. Um, the and they're actually at increased risk of experiencing violence and victimization themselves. So, you know, we try really hard at Giffords to make sure that our laws are based on when individuals are displaying dangerous behaviors and less so when they have a particular diagnosis. Again, I keep pulling out the studies, but I'm a researcher, so I have to do that. But one study found that um, if we had a magic pill that could sort of cure all mental illness, um, we would only reduce violence by about 4% because that's sort of the percent that we can attribute to diagnosable mental illness. There was a researcher at Duke that I interviewed a few years ago uh, on a similar subject to, to this. And uh, the question of the conference that he was at was, is there a connection between mental illness and, and gun violence? And he had a similar conclusion to what you said based on his research. And he found that the two main causes that would 
can predict whether there will be gun violence or not is one is a person does a person have a violent background like if they've been arrested for a violent crime or two do they have access to guns those are the two main criteria that can predict the amount of gun violence that that's uh, that's likely uh just i don't know if you're familiar with that study or if you have yeah. anything to add to that yeah, I think that's totally right. You know, I think there was a really great study too that came out of the FBI just recently looking at active shooters. And, you know, it found that the the kinds of behaviors that preceded um these kinds of events were were things like, you know, people got divorced, they got laid off from their job, and it created these sort of crises. Um, so it was less about having a diagnosis of some mental illness. But but actually experiencing this big life stressor and having access to firearms. Our guest is Kelly Drain, the research director with Giffords, and we're talking about the connection between hate crimes and gun laws. And later on in the show, we'll hear more about Hurricane Adalia. We'll get the latest forecast. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF Tampa on August 29th. And we're talking about some policy changes that could could impact and could reduce gun violence, especially gun violence that's attached to hate crimes. And one of the other conclusions that your report finds is that laws that prohibit guns on government property and at civic events like protests, demonstrations, or meetings of legislative bodies would protect from, from these uh, hate-fueled gun violence crimes. How would that work? Yeah. So, you know, there are many types of laws that restrict access to guns in certain sensitive places. You know, there's there are laws that prevent people from bringing guns to schools. Um, some states have passed other kinds of what we call sensitive place, sensitive place restrictions. Um, and I think these laws are particularly important because everyone in this country needs to feel um, that they can participate in civic events. Everyone needs to feel safe when they go to vote. Everyone should be emboldened to go and protest and demonstrate um, to hold um celebration, cultural celebrations, pride parades, et cetera. Um, and so it's really important that we have laws that can prevent guns from being introduced into those spaces where there is um, public debate and discussion, perhaps, or um, where vulnerable groups are represented. Um, so these laws are really critical. And again, I think it's it's not just critical to preventing gun violence, but I would also argue that it's critical to pre preserving and protecting our democracy. If people don't feel comfortable um, and safe participating in our democracy, I think we have um, a really big problem um, that that not, not just a problem of safety, but a problem of our democracy. And the final uh, policy suggestion that you make is that hate crime offenders should be disarmed. What is what does that entail? How would that work and why would that be effective? Yeah. So, you know, right now, if you are convicted of a misdemeanor hate crime, um, that you would not be prohibited from um, having firearms in most states in this country. Um, we know that people that commit hate crimes are at elevated risk of committing future violence, um, that that sort of like we were talking about related to mental illness, that that behavior of committing violence motivated by hate is a significant risk factor for perpetrating future violence. And so these laws would add, um, you know, another category of eligibility that people um, who have been convicted of these kinds of crimes would not be allowed to um, to purchase or possess firearms. So we've been talking about your your uh, report and about how connections between hate crimes and gun violence. So is there anything else that we haven't covered in this conversation that you'd like to let our listeners know about before I let you go? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, we saw in, in Jacksonville, um, we have seen too many times where there is anti-Black gun violence, anti-Jewish um, gun violence. And, um, you know, this is really a product of our lax gun laws um, that really allow people that are filled with hate to carry out horrific acts of violence. And I think it's really important that people understand that these are preventable. Um, there are policies we can put in place to reduce the frequency and lethality of these events. And we don't have to live in a society where this is happening with such frequency. If people want to find out more about Giffords, where can they go or to read this report? Yeah, our report is available on Giffords.org, G-I-F-F-O-R-D-S.org. Well, thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Kelly. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. 
Kelly Drain is a research director at Giffords, and we've been talking about the connection between hate crimes and gun laws. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. I'm broadcasting from WMNF live on August 29th, 2023.